of the Grand Campaign. Our mission is to build community, seek inspiration, inspire justice, find peace. My name is Paul Russell. I think my pronouns are Canadian. And I have the honor of serving on the worship committee and leading today's service. Reverend Beth and Reverend Sally are both away today after re renewing ministers' retreat this past week. <coughs> we put together today's service uh, with pretty much the, uh, with the help of all the people on the worship committee, who I very much thank. And uh, uh, we, we hope that the, the, uh, the stories that, that we bring to you will, will help to engender some interesting thoughts and certainly came to us. I welcome us all in person as a virtual way, fully into the sacred time together. I have a question. Thank you. I, I hate to get too close to this mic. <laughs> Very good. Um, I welcome us all in person and virtually, fully into the sacred time together. I especially welcome any guests who are joining us today and invite you to complete a visitor's card, which is available in the corner, uh, so that we may stay connected. Uh, we are a congregation of all ages, which means we embrace all the rituals and sounds and distractive energy that kids and young people bring into this space. While young people are welcome to stay in the sanctuary for the entire service, kids and youth are invited to join our religious education exploration volunteers after our time for all ages. Coming up quite soon. Noted in your order of service for their own time of faith formation. We also invite folks to honor each other's boundaries around close contact and to maintain the distance if someone is wearing a red or yellow lighter. Lanyards are available in the entry for anyone who needs more space or wants to move around and stretch them. A north case. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, we urge you to uh, take uh, to give them uh, that, that uh, uh, freedom. At uh, this time, if. if uh, Anyone wishes to move around and stretch your legs for any reason, you are welcome to enjoy the audio feed of the service, even in the, uh, the fellowship hall across the way. And speaking of the fellowship hall, after the service, everyone is invited for conversation and kinship during our social hour. <clears throat> At this uh, um, our point, let me introduce our very able uh, uh, worship associate for the day, uh, um, Angela. Uh, and, uh, And now, we formally begin our services. As Unitarian Universalists across the country do, by writing a chalice, which is one symbol of our shared living faith tradition, 
and which reminds us of the spark of life that connects us all to these. Join me in our child sliding notes, which are in your printed order of service. We kindle this flame as a symbolic connection to our ancestors who bravely shared their life in days past, to all of our kin near and far who hold on tightly to hope in this moment, and to the people who will follow us in love in the moments yet to come. May this flame guide us as we live imperfectly into our collective becoming, called into faithful covenant again and again. And now for something special, the opening song, Circle Game by Joni Mitchell. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite you all on choruses two, three, and four to sing along with us. Oh, 
what, what you are, are going to have to do, we're going to try to teach him to count. To count to three. Okay. You got three cards start here. And uh, on, on the first card, you, if you listen to it, especially the children, and on the first card, you just all say, one. And on the second one, two. And the three, and that'll have to learn. So, so, let's try it. Let's see if you can learn.
part of our mission is to build community, and in that vein, we have many spiritually enriching and socially engaging programs here. There are many opportunities to connect in the community within these walls and beyond. I want to highlight just a few of those this morning. Today at 3 p.m., please join us back here in the sanctuary for the Autumn Cooperative Concert. That will be here at 3 p.m. It will have Parkland Guitar Ensemble, Parkland's Chamber Singers, and our very own crooners. There will be a light reception with snacks that will take place after the performances in the Belcher Hall. And it is free and open to the public. Another concert I want to highlight, it's not too late, I believe, if, there, if, uh, if you don't have tickets already, next Friday, October uh, 27th, 6.30 to 8, there'll be a special concert here in the sanctuary, all that jazz. Speak with Jerry Fry and Priscilla Kwan uh, if you're interested in tickets. Be sure to read the e-news for more announcements and opportunities to connect and grow. While the mission of this congregation is made possible through the shared time and talents and financial generosity of our members and friends, we know that our work within this congregation is strengthened by our generosity, or strengthened, sorry, by our connections to the wider community. To live into the spiritual practice of generosity and interdependence, we share a portion of all non-designated offering funds each week with an organization whose values align with ours. This month, our shared offering will go to Survivor Resource Center, which is the sole agency dedicated to serving the needs of survivors of sexual violence in Vermilion, Edgar, and Clark counties. We are grateful to support them, and we are grateful for all the ways you support this community. With gratitude and appreciation, the offering will now be gratefully received. We'll have special offering music, The Shape of Life by Julia Cronin. Mm -hmm. I'm 
Besides two summer internships in industry when I was a student and one year as a federal bureaucrat, I have never worked in the real world. I taught at the University of Illinois and at Purdue University, and I am now officially retired from both, but I'm failing at retirement. I still serve on committees for professional associations and on uh, advisory boards for research projects. I serve as a peer reviewer of journal manuscripts and grad proposals. I mentor graduate students and younger professors. It seems that everyone wants my advice, a fact that astonishes my children. <laughs> with 42 years of experience as a professor, I have gained some wisdom that I can share with junior colleagues. For example, I told a graduate student that after meeting with his dissertation advisor, he should follow up with an email message to document significant decisions. As another example, since departments don't regularly require teaching portfolios at promotion time, I told a professor that her teaching statement should refer to her online teaching portfolio, which then references can access to write evaluation letters. I try to give advice only when requested, and then I don't charge for my professional services. As my wife Cindy has said, I'm retired in salary only. <laughs> Thanks to the largesse of the taxpayers of Illinois, I am privileged to receive a pension from the state. Sometimes I receive a small honorarium for serving on advi an advisory board, but for mentoring and peer reviewing, I do not receive any payment. When I visit a doctor or a dentist, I do expect to pay for their professional services, but academic practices are different. People outside the academy are puzzled when academics perform professional services for free. They call peer review of journal manuscripts unpaid labor. They don't realize that academics practice in a gift economy. Before the invention of money, before the development of bartering, communities operated on the gift economy. Each service was a gift. In a small village, a woman skilled in the use of medicinal herbs would help other villages, villagers when they were sick. In turn, she was helped by a man who could repair her old fishing nets. In the book Braiding Sweetgrass, author Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, Generosity is simultaneously a moral and a material imperative, especially among people who live close to the land and know its waves of plenty and scarcity, where the well-being of one is linked to the well-being of all. 
wealth among traditional people is measured in, uh, by having enough to give away. Hoarding the gift, we become constipated with wealth, bloated with possessions. In a culture of gratitude, everyone knows that gifts will follow the circle of a re reciprocity and flow back to you again. This time you give, and the next time you receive. Both the honor of giving and the humility of receiving are necessary halves of the equation. In other words, when I help you now, you will help others later. You give back by paying it forward. So, when I mentor junior colleagues, sharing my wisdom about the arcane practices of academic life, I tell them that they can pay it forward by mentoring others in the future. In short, not everything needs to be monetized. It is a privilege to share the gift of wisdom. we have is The Neutral Zone by Karen Ritzer. <laughs> last Friday was, I think, my last day of working full-time. I say I think because we never know what will really happen in the future. In mid-2019, I also had reason to think that my last day of full-time work was, had just taken place when the campus unit I worked in closed, and there I was, me and several colleagues without a job. As it turned out, my dad died over the next couple of months, and I was so grateful to be without any work commitments. And then, in January 2020, the organization I had been volunteering with hired me and I worked with them for almost the next four years, until last Friday. I had no idea that job would happen. So here I am. Tomorrow will be my first day of retirement. I don't count the weekend. And I already broke the cardinal rule that is given to all new retirees when I said yes to Sam Bashir's and agreed to be part of this service <laughs> to talk about life's transitions. The cardinal rule and advice I hear from nearly all retirees is to say no to everything until you find your rhythm to give yourself some space. So what can I say about retirement? I can say that it's going to be another transition, and I've had plenty of those. I've worked full time essentially since college, including two years of teaching in the Peace Corps, and my jobs have been varied. Demographic researcher, study abroad advisor, sam survey sampling methodologist, and then campaign organizer for a nonprofit advocacy organization. I haven't climbed to the top of any of these positions, nor have I wanted to. I've learned a lot about different topics, and then at some point I've decided to try something new. Often, I left a job before I knew what the next thing would be. At each transition, there was some anxiety, some searching, some wondering what would come next, but I always landed. Some of you will remember my mother, Alice Foote. One of the many books she left to me was the book called Transitions, Making Life Sense of Life's Changes by William Bridges. I had scanned it briefly in the past, but now took a closer look. It was fun to see the various parts of the book she, that she had underlined and highlighted. The book outlines the importance of breaking transitions into three distinct parts.
parts. The ending of something, an in-between period, and the beginning of something else. It's not just suddenly an ending followed by a beginning. The author calls this middle period the neutral zone and says, quote, the neutral zone is a time of inner reorientation. It is the phase of the transition process that the modern world pays least attention to, treating ourselves like appliances that can be unplugged and plugged in again. We have forgotten the importance of the fallow time and winter and rests in music. So I'm entering the neutral zone, the time to stop and reflect, the time to say no more so I get my rhythm. I have some thoughts about the new beginnings. We will travel some, and perhaps I'll take piano lessons again, relearn how to sew, or go get back to speaking French. I'd like to read more and to be of service. I have no idea how any of these will play out, but I couldn't have planned the various the very, the very career path I had either. I don't think anyone can really know what life or what retirement will look like. It's constructed of a combination of working toward dreams and responding to what life hands us. It will be interesting to look back at some point in the future to see what unfolded. For now, I'm fine with just taking some time and following a quote that is attributed to Rumi, to respond to every call that excites your spirit. We know all of us bring both joys and sorrows when we gather. Practicing our interdependence, we share those joys and sorrows with each other, knowing that in sharing, our sorrows might, may be lightened and our joys may be abundant. If you have a joy or sorrow you want to publicly share today, I invite you to complete a card, which the ushers will bring to you, or to pull out your phones if you're in the room or online, and submit it to joys and sorrows at UUCUC. We'll sing together our blessing song, May the Long Time Sun, as you complete your written joys and sorrows. And we invite you, if you're moved to do so, to come to the front during the song and drop a stone for your sorrow or a petal for your joys in the water bowl on our child's table. May the act of sharing together bring us comfort.
very few of them. Although if you carry them in your heart, you can create space for that as well. From Melissa Watson, a star. Another major childcare facility in our community is closing in December, just after the holidays. My thoughts go out to the dedicated staff who will need to find new employment and to the many families who will need to find care. Another sorrow from Katie Goslin. Concern for one of our newborn twins, Violet. Despite an uncomplicated birth and good health, she will likely need surgery within the first year to help receive her skull. Please keep Violet and the rest of the Gosling family in your thoughts and prayers. The surgery itself is fairly straightforward, but nothing prepares one for their newborn baby needing to have surgery in the first year of life. From Allison Bell, a bittersweet joy. Our foster son, JL, will be moving in with his new adoptive family sometime next month. We are so happy for his new parents and for him to be going to a home where he is already so loved, but we will miss his sweet presence in our home. And so now I invite Kiria. This is both a joy and a sorrow. Our incredible AV tech professional, Selena Gonzalez, recently got a long hoped for promotion at her other job, working as an education program specialist at the Museum of the Grand Prairie. The sorrow is that that means that today is her last day um, as our AV tech. Everyone here has been the beneficiary of Selena's hard work over the last year. Whether you watch our live stream online, which she makes possible, or if you're here in the sanctuary reading and singing from the slides and videos she prepares. Selena, um, will you come to the front for a minute?
by our very own MR. Stand up and be seen. them pronouns on the choir director who sings in the bathroom with one on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> when those who have the power to name and to socially construct reality choose not to see or hear you, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked in the mirror and saw nothing. It takes some strength of soul, and not just individual strength, but collective understanding, to resist this void, this non-being, into which you are thrust, and to stand up, demanding to be seen and heard. I can't take credit for that. That's American poet and essayist Adrian Rich's work from the 70s and 80s, and it served as fundamental texts for second wave femi feminism. Although much of Rich's work focused on women rejecting gendered societal expectations, it also encouraged readers, regardless of gender, to internalize their existence as valid and present themselves without fear of targeting or erasure. When those who have the power choose not to see or hear you, stand up and demand to be seen. When Paul and Sam invited me to speak for today's service, I nervously accepted their offer. I was nervous because I am the choir director at this location, but I was worried more about the possibility of being placed in a position where I would become another curiosity for the public to figure out. Is MR a boy or a girl? Would sharing my story further my identity as other? Or would it really be helpful for someone to hear? I think all of these things are true. And because we don't have that much time to share all of my story today. I'll share a few bends in the road. I grew up in a small town, not too far north of here, where the demographics were mostly white, mostly straight, mostly non-trans people. I came out as gay to my best friend Heidi when I was 12, and she kept my secret for the five years that it took me to muster up the courage to share it with the world. But in that environment, I should have just waited until after graduation. While the threats of violence were hard to escape, the thoughts of suicide were even harder. Why did I choose now to stand up for myself? I wasn't even sure that being attracted to girls was all that different from my brother being attracted to girls. It's the big deal. Apparently it was too big of a deal for a stepfather who never wanted a gay child, so he made me sign a contract on the day that they picked me up from the pavilion the Behavioral Health Care Center down the street, where they left me for weeks. This contract stated that I needed to be the good person and not the gay person. I was 17. I signed this stupid contract because it was the only way that they would let me leave the pavilion, but I never intended to hide who I was. After that, I moved out. Bend number one. It's likely that there were many other obstacles that were in my way between the ages of 17 and 30, but for time's sake, I will skip forward to the most recent decade for the next couple of events in the room. On my 30th birthday, I knew that I wanted to finally become a parent. I never wanted to physically carry a child, but my then wife at the time and I decided that since I was the older of the two, I should at least give it a try. We sat down at the computer, like most people with fertility woes do, and selected a donor from a cryobank in California. Did I really want to do this? Was I really going to be the one to carry this child? <laughs> well, a couple months later, I was doing the thing that would not let me avoid the body that I was assigned at birth. I was pregnant. My body wasn't my body anymore. And not in the way that most people experience pregnancy. I was literally watching myself from a dissociative state emotionally numb, but somehow hyper-aware of every physical change that my female body was experiencing. I hated myself. I wanted to escape. And the suicidal ideations were so strong at times that I felt like I was never gonna make it through that pregnancy alive. 
But there was something about the creation happening inside me that led me to believe that it was going to give me a new life. So with very little sense of self, I obviously made it through the pregnancy and have a wonderful eight-year-old Frankie to thank for making me, me. So I did the pregnant thing. I nursed the kid for the almost three years of his life, and then even harder depression set in. I never felt so sad and alone and confused with the things that my body had done. My body? My brain knew that this body hadn't been mine for far longer than it took to create and sustain a child. It hadn't been mine for the last 34 years of my life. I'd been masquerading around as a woman, a butch woman, but a woman. After surviving some of the most debilitating depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and traumatic accusations, I knew it was time to give up. To give up being Miss Roland. I knew I wasn't her. She had been accused of grooming her female students while she was teaching in the small town where she grew up. She was slowly dying, and it wasn't until starting my journey as a PhD student four years ago that I found out what a gift her death actually was. <laughs> in 2019, about 23 years after I first came out, I came out again. But this time, it wasn't about uncovering my sexuality. It was about being reborn as MR. I experimented with names and pronouns, researched top surgeons, and more recently, for the last seven months, began gender affirmative care through the addition of testosterone into my daily routine. My home life has never been more supportive of my transition, and although Frankie still calls me Mama, almost everyone else calls me MR, Miguel, or Dr. Roland. I still live in a strange space where frequent misgendering is painful, and while it may not always be malicious, the trauma that it causes me to relive is real. <laughs> and while I've never felt more satisfied with where I am physically, emotionally, or spiritually, I'll never forget how hard it was to refuse to be stopped by the many rejections that life had to throw at me. I will continue to resist being placed in a void, a space where I am unseen, and stand up demanding to be seen.
bring to our eyes something like the, the farthest reaches, the, the farthest gamut of what can face one in a life change and how one is disposed to respond to it. Uh, reviewing one by one here, Michael, I, as, as I evaluate his contribution, Michael finds joy, a, a new joy, in sharing knowledge and wisdom that he's built over the decades of his professional life and finds himself, therefore, in a new, freer spirit, actually, of community and not simply as an agent of, of the various institutions. So that's, that's, a, that's a freedom and a joy, right, which he is, and in, in his case, he's continuing to use the knowledge and the skills that he built up over a, a, a lifetime, and, and is finding joy easily in it. Karen is, I would like that, I'm sure she would uh, agree, uh, in, in the middle of our spectrum. Uh, she's led, as she said, a very nice work and is, isn't troubled by the prospect of starting retirement any more than any of the other changes in her life. But she does take the changes seriously and is happy to rest in what she calls the, the neutral zone, where without apprehension, and, uh, she can simply look calmly at the alternatives and uh, be ready to try them. So she's in the middle of the spectrum where there's the least the not immediate joy, but uh, again, there's no great apprehension. And MR, however, uh, in the most powerful uh, presentation you know, that you can imagine, recounts a powerful story of difficulty, not retirement level, but from childhood onward, difficult life changing de decisions made early in life, driven by an undeniable self-knowledge, and which unfortunately repeatedly incurred severe unjust rejection, and which has happened at every stage. Let me suggest uh, um, uh, kind of a, a metaphorical uh, uh, image here. Uh, you may recall the uh, the welcome uh, screen uh, picture which occurred in, in the e news presentations uh, for uh, advertising our today's service. Uh, and that shows a, a sunny woodland with a winding path through it. And comparatively speaking, you might say that the first two respondents here, the first two reflections, reflect that, that spirit. Uh, that there is sunlight here, there will be sunlight ahead, possibly even more, uh, which uh, uh, it has been found. But here, the, that image doesn't work. Think of a dark thicket surrounded by brambles with a thorn waiting you at every step. And that's a better picture, which I did not put graphically before you. And um, so I have been uh, in, 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 uh, in all of their presence uh, and, and determination and, and power to proceed you know, and, and the, the great musical leadership skills that they have shown as our uh, musical uh, director. 
So, uh, that, that is something to think about again. Great thanks to all. And uh, at this point, we need to be in the end of service. Please rise in body or in spirit and sing number six, sing number six with us, just as long as I have. Until we are.